glass of time, the desert's grains Ever blow, grind and blast the camel trains Loaded with opium, pot and red wine These being the potions to jog our brains Yes, where the river flows, where grass grows You and I, beloved, drink the wine's remains Why there is something, and further extensions. If a lack of anything were the case, but, it, has no time, so no, were. Well, nothing, can't be, for existence has no alternative of non-existence, and so that notion is out and done with. There is no, case, as in, fact. Nothing, cannot even be meant, much less have any properties or be productive, and so even any notion of it is forever squashed. So, something had to ever be, it having no alternative, with no option not to be, with no opposite, and with no possibility of it coming from the impossible, nothing. The something, then, is eternal, in that it is uncreated can never go away. It is permanent as the causeless cause of what comes forth of it, which can only be temporaries. The something cannot be still and unmoving, for then naught could have become as the temporary happenings that we take as something. The impossible stillness thus gains single quote marks, akin to its relative of nothing, neither one able to be. So, the permanent something of necessity as the only true and lasting real thing can only form the temporaries through various arrangements of itself in such a way that it ever remains as itself. It has to do this because it cannot be still and is thus energetic and so it has motion within it. Its nature has to be that the something is the simplest state of being, as partless, for it would not be fundamental as the only cause it if were composed of parts whose fundamentality preceded its own. It also has to be continuous, because it is both unbreakable and unmakeable, not to mention again that it cannot have spacers of the non-existent nothingness in it. The something is thus an existent that cannot not be. So, then, the lesser, which in this case is the least, gives rise to the elementaries, the composites, and the complex, as the temporary universe, which from our point of view as one of the temporaries might call it to be greater, in the sense that the temporary is more interesting than the simple base alone, much grander in its splendor of multiplicity, even. The transcendental notion of the lesser having to come from a greater can now be totally thrown out, as another impossible, and, besides, the notion leads to an infinite regress. That template is dead. It is also that not anything composite can be fundamental, not even the tiny proton, much less anything more composite or even infinitely complex, such as a great mind, begging the question, that didn't even have to be begged. 
So, we have the truth, but out of curiosity as well as for the ultimate satisfaction from the proof of confirmation, we look for the physical support to the philosophy of logic in the physics of science. The quantum vacuum with its overall quantum field fits the bill to a T, the rather persisting elementaries form from excitations at the stable rungs of energy quanta in the quantum field. The elementaries don't get quantized, they are the quanta. We know the rest of the story. Quantum field theory, QFT, gave us all of physics and most of our modern devices. Universes may come and go, but the permanent existence ever remains, and anything can become of it, but they are temporaries. All that underlies our lives is now known. In the stars our atoms are slowly grown. From the quantum field elementaries. O oh Mars not of how human fate is sown. Have you ever wondered how might our lives be different if the art of writing had never evolved, if we had never moved beyond simple pictographs and cave paintings? Today, we embark on a journey through time, exploring the evolution of writing styles and their impact on humanity. Our story begins with the earliest form of writing known as cuneiform, developed by the ancient Sumerians around 5,000 years ago. This system, composed of wedge-shaped marks made on clay tablets, was a crucial step in human history. It enabled us to record our thoughts, our laws, our transactions, and our stories for future generations. Fast forward to ancient Egypt, where the hieroglyphic writing system was in its prime. This beautiful, intricate form of writing was not merely a means of communication, but also an art form adorning the walls of temples and tombs, telling the stories of gods and pharaohs. Gradually, Writing evolved into alphabetic systems, like the Phoenician alphabet, which laid the groundwork for many modern alphabetic systems. This was a significant shift, as it meant that writing became more accessible, no longer a skill reserved for the elite. As we move into the Middle Ages, we witness the birth of illuminated manuscripts. These beautifully crafted books were more than just written text. They were works of art, with elaborate designs and illustrations enhancing the written word. The advent of the printing press in the 15th century, thanks to Johannes Gutenberg, revolutionized writing once again. Books became more accessible to the masses, leading to an explosion of literacy and a new era of information exchange. Fast forward to the modern day and we see the rise of digital writing. From the concise 140 character tweets to the long form blog posts, digital writing has transformed the way we communicate and share information. But what does the future hold? With technologies like artificial intelligence and virtual reality on the horizon, the evolution of writing is far from over. To summarize, the evolution of writing styles has been a journey of constant transformation, from the earliest cuneiform scripts to the digital writing of today. Each stage in this evolution has not only reflected our changing societies, but also shaped them, demonstrating the profound impact of writing on our lives. In the words of the great author Aldous Huxley, words can be like x-rays if you use them properly. They'll go through anything. You read and you're pierced. So as we continue to write, to evolve, and to pierce the veil of the unknown, we carry forward the legacy of those ancient Sumerians who first dared to etch their thoughts into clay. Be happy for this moment. This moment is your life. These profound words were once spoken by Omar Khayyam, a Persian mathematician, astronomer, and philosopher who lived a thousand years ago. His wisdom, encapsulated in quatrains known as Rubaiyat, continues to resonate even today. Consider for instance the moonrise. Just as it is reborn each night, so too are we reborn each day, whirling within our own paths. We untie the entangled knots of our thoughts seeking clarity, just as Omar Khayyam sought to untangle the mysteries of the universe. Omar Khayyam's quatrains invite us to join the ancients, to leave behind the worries of the present, and to immerse ourselves in the wisdom of the past. He urges us to fill our cups with knowledge before our time runs out, for once we are gone, we may worship no more. His words remind us of the transient nature of worldly hopes. They can turn to ashes or, 
if tread upon well can prosper. They are like snow upon the desert's dusty surface, providing light for a brief moment before they dissipate. But Kayam also warns us against the dangers of blind faith. He talks of dogma, carved in stone, which can put reason to flight. His words caution us against the noose of fright that blind faith can become, trapping human beings in darkness. In the face of such darkness Kayam found a beacon of hope. He tried to make sense of the world and in doing so he found an answer to life's dark quiz. He realized that we must live this life by whatever light we have. In essence Omar Khayyam's Rubayat serve as a guide for life. They remind us of the transient nature of worldly hopes and the dangers of blind faith. They encourage us to seek knowledge and wisdom, and to live our lives by the light we have. And above all, they remind us to be happy for this moment, for this moment is our life. Why does the Divine Creator, if there is one, seem surprised and disappointed with the outcome of his creation? Humanity. This is a question that has been posed time and again throughout history, and it is one that poet and philosopher Omar Khayyam tackles in his Rubaiyat. Khayyam boldly questions the existence of God. He ponders the paradoxes that arise when we declare something to be invisible, a realm beyond our comprehension. This daring skepticism is reflected in verses such as, You shall be you no more, and, and naked on the air of heaven ride. These lines could be interpreted as a challenge to the notion of an eternal soul, a nebulous entity often associated with religious beliefs. Kayam suggests that our identity, our self, is not some intangible phantom, but a product of our physical brain and its complex network of neurons. In his verses, Kayam also explores the limitations of human knowledge. Lines like, Evermore came out by the same door as in I went, and, But not the master knot of human fate, speak to the human predicament of seeking answers that may be beyond our reach. This is a dilemma that not even the grandest cosmic mechanisms can solve. The crux of Kayam's philosophy, however, lies in the importance he places on the now. He emphasizes the present moment over the unborn tomorrow and dead yesterday. This belief is encapsulated in his famous quatrain, The Moving Finger Writes, and having writ, moves on. Nor all thy piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. While traditionally interpreted as a commentary on predestination, these lines can also be understood in a modern context. They reflect the inexorable march of time, each moment arising and then vanishing, replaced by the next. This deterministic chain of events cannot be altered or stopped. In essence, Kayam's philosophy is one of acceptance and focusing on the present. It acknowledges the limitations of human understanding and the inevitability of time's progression. It is a philosophy that resonates even in the current day as we grapple with similar existential questions and strive to make sense of our place in the universe. In conclusion, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam offers a profound exploration of the human condition and the concept of God. Its verses delve into the mysteries of existence, the limits of knowledge, and the value of the present moment. Despite being centuries old, Kayam's philosophy remains relevant today, providing insights and perspectives that continue to resonate in our modern world. Imagine you're in a library, a vast repository of knowledge. Each book in the library is a unique world, with its own characters, its own plot, and its own language. This library is our cosmos, and each book is a different aspect of our reality. Now let's delve deeper into this analogy. Each book in the library represents the literature of the unified verse. The unified verse is the collection of all that exists, all the stars, all the planets, all the galaxies. It's a grand story, a narrative crafted by the forces of nature. Within each book, there's a story. This story represents the ongoing tree of life, a tale of evolution, adaptation, survival, and extinction. Each chapter, each paragraph, each sentence, and each word contributes to the overall narrative. The paragraphs in our book represent the different species that populate our planet. Each species has its own unique characteristics, its own role in the ecosystem, its own place in the grand scheme of life. Each sentence in our paragraph is a creature. These creatures, whether they're humans, animals, or microscopic organisms, interact with each other in their environment, shaping and being shaped by the world around them. The subjects of our sentences are verbed by the biotype DNA cells. These cells, the basic building blocks of life, carry the genetic information that determines the characteristics of each creature. 
They're the phrases that make up our sentences, each one unique, each one vital. Within these phrases, we find dictionary molecules. They form the words of our sentences, the atoms that make up our cells. Each molecule, like each word, has its own meaning, its own role to play in the grand narrative of life. The alphabet letters of these words are the particles of the standard model. These particles, the most basic units of matter, come together to form atoms, just as letters come together to form words. The strokes of these letters are inked by the particles, which are in turn papered by the covariant quantum fields. These fields, like the pages of our book, provide the foundation upon which reality is built. Finally, the energy or gravity that binds everything together that enables the existence of the universe and everything in it is the capability that holds our library together. It's the force that keeps the books on the shelves, that keeps the pages in the books, that keeps the words on the pages. To summarize, our cosmos is a grand library filled with books that represent the unified verse. Each book contains a story, the ongoing tree of life made up of paragraphs that represent species. Each species is made up of creatures, the sentences in our story, which are verbed by biotype DNA cells, the phrases in our sentences. These phrases are made up of dictionary molecules, the words in our sentences, which in turn are made up of atoms, the alphabet letters of our words. These atoms are formed by particles, the strokes of our letters, which are inked by quantum fields, the pages of our book. And finally, the capability, the energy or gravity that holds everything together is the force that keeps our library standing. This is the intricate, interconnected nature of our reality, a grand narrative written in the language of the cosmos.
Thank you.